Hello, I'm Tim Sandal and uh, this video was recorded uh, as a webinar and it's looking at clean room clothing, clean room gowning, the contamination risk presented by people to the clean room environment and it covers everything you need to know when you're selecting different garment providers and getting across how you want personnel to behave in the clean room. And people are cleaning clean rooms are a major contamination source for microorganisms in particular because of the natural process of shedding. And shedding is manifest in skin flakes and oils from the skin, cosmetics and perfume, spittle, clothing debris, so with organisms attached to lint, fibres and so on, hair, the act of touching and transfer, and by the relative speed of movement. So there are a number of ways that people are a contamination contributor on a high scale. And an example of risks from people, this slide shows the number of bacteria on a person from different body locations. And this information has been gathered from the recent human microbiome activity which has been led by the United States National Institute of Health, where 300 individuals, volunteers, have an array of samples taken. But the various locations give some idea of those body locations that might present the biggest microbial contributory risks. And these are some of the areas that gloves and garments need to address. And also, provide us with um, an indication of what can be produced in changing rooms as people go through the change process. So if people are carrying this much contamination and as clean rooms are hopefully correctly designed air spaces, it stands that clean rooms will work well until people enter them. And people shed millions of skin cells per day. And based on research undertaken by Bill White at the University of Glasgow, it's estimated that around 20% of particles in a clean room where there are human operators will be carrying microorganisms. And these tend to be referred to as microbial carrying particles. And with people, the main concerns are with improper behavior, and in matters relating to gowning, like gown quality and the length of time that the gown is worn for. And people can also spread contamination, as we already mentioned, through touching, but also through sneezing and through coughing. So with people, it is also good practice to reduce the total number of interventions, the total number of times that people need to touch things and particularly the total number of times that people need to interrelate with clean rooms or clean areas of different classifications. So in the world of sterile products manufacturing, this might be most uh, applicable in terms of interacting between grade A and grade B. And in this kind of scenario, we want to limit the number of times that hands and arms are transferred into and out of a working area of the clean zone. It's also important to consider where an individual is actually allowed to ingress and break one barrier to another. The dispersion of contaminants from, a, from surface to air within a clean room is also highly dependent on how people act. So we need to consider glove and gown quality, the need to change gloves, and the regular sanitization of gloves as part of this control process. But even wearing clean room suits, people will generate particles. And there's a research which was undertaken back in 1965, but the data produced still remains relevant today. And this relates to the generation of particles relating to particular activities. And you can see that on the table on the screen. Therefore, the movement pattern of the operator inside the clean zone 
is of vital importance and this should be performed at slow speed and in a controlled way. For working at too high a speed inside the clean zone, there is a risk of creating turbulence which in turn can affect the cleanliness of the product handled. So slow deliberate movements. If someone is going to rush and engage in frenetic activity, then it's no matter how good the quality of the gown is, you're eventually going to reach a point of compromise when the gown will not work as effectively as it should be. And this next slide further elaborates on particle generation. And this is data undertaken in Sweden, uh, and it dates back to 2005. And this shows the, uh, how the different numbers of particles are linked to different numbers of activities, and also how many of these particles have been demonstrated to carry microorganisms. And here the Swedish researchers undertook activities in specially designed by aerosol chambers. So they were able to directly measure particle and viable counts. And this again uh, emphasizes the importance of good gown and face mask protection. We can also add uh, further data. So here is a, another slide, and this is a research dating to the year 2000. And this is looking at why cosmetics should not be allowed into clean rooms. And you can see the relative difference of different types of cosmetics and the level of particles that they will generate. So the eyeshadow and mascara are huge generators of particle contamination. So this is why there should be a strong discipline in place that people do not wear cosmetics into clean rooms because you're creating a considerable particle risk and placing a design, taking the garments and clothing outside of their design tolerance. So I mentioned earlier about the uh, Human Microbiome Project and how this provides some important information into the world of garment control. So the US researchers in this case collected samples using various culture independent methods of microbial community characterization. So they drew upon metagenomics which is a method that provides a broad genetic perspective on a single microbial community where the genetic material or metagenome from environmental samples can be sequenced and studied. And they also used whole genome sequencing. And this is really focusing on the different microbial niches in relation to the human body. And this next slide shows an output from that research. And this is showing, so this is a characterization of the skin microbiome drawn from a paper by uh, Bryce and colleagues. And here it's showing uh, the different types of microorganisms that are found in relation to different uh, niches. So example, with the forehead around the sebaceous glands, then we're finding high levels of anaerobic bacteria particularly propionibacterium, which is uh, associated with the formation of acne, and relatively high levels of crinibacterium, staphylococci, and micrococci. Similar organism profiles for the scalp. When we come down to a different parts of the body, and we're looking at the, um, between the fingers and the toe webs, we've got very big variations in moisture, temperature, and pH. And then this is where we're able to recover more fungi, and also um, gram negatives. And it's one of the um, uh, myths that needs to be challenged is that um, gram negatives are not associated with the human body when in fact there are, there is now growing evidence that there are gram negatives associated with the outer layers of the human body, particularly Acinetobacter and Paracoccus. So this information again, um, it's a fairly useful background information if we do start seeing um, particular types of organisms found in particular maybe changing rooms or clean rooms and we do have worries about 
uh, gown control, mask control, glove control, and potentially there may be a connection here that we can relate the data um, back to. I also mentioned about um, shedding. So the primary thing that shed is rarely uh, individual microorganisms, but more likely microorganisms attached to skin detritus. And these are typically not single skin cells, but a combination of skin cells in the form of flakes. And the typical size, again drawing on uh, some of the pioneering work by Bill White, uh, the size is maybe 33 by 44 by 4 microns. And at a rate of 30,000 to 40,000 dead skin cells shed from the surface of the skin every minute. So one of the um, less savoury facts is that every four days we have totally replaced the outer layer of our skin. So we've shed our entire skin cell outer content of the epithelia and we've completely replaced that. And again, that connection with um, a high number of those between 10 and 20% are carrying microorganisms. So we need to control contamination from people in clean room facilities. And this is by the application of two fairly straightforward principles. We wrap people to minimize the amount of shedding of microorganisms. And we put in place localized protection around product to minimize the amount of contact with people. And this is typically achieved through um, clean room cascades or with localized unidirectional airflow. And when we break this localized protection capsule, then this is what we would class as an intervention. So the training in gowning is also important, and this needs to be assessed periodically and monitored frequently. Another important aspect is with personnel hygiene. And all staff working in a clean room must manage their own personnel hygiene. And this includes the importance of taking a daily shower and uh, changing of underwear and also the washing of hands regularly. And these may sound like um, basic principles, but you might be surprised that sometimes um, people who do visit clean rooms regularly may not necessarily practice one of these um, on a daily basis. Um, also needs to be mindful that sometimes in relation to showering, uh, some people, it's preferable that they shower in the mornings before they come to work. While people, it's more preferable that they shower in the evenings. And you can get variances in the effect of showering and the relative rate of skin shedding. It also stands that the different types of cleaning compounds used when someone showers or takes a bath have different effects on the outer layers of the skin. And it can be if these are too harsh, you may have chemicals that effectively clean the skin surface, but they might also reduce the presence of natural lubricants, making the skin too dry and therefore more susceptible to particle generation. So here it's important to, um, you know, if you do have someone who suspects shedding, um, then there might be things to examine about the time of day of showering and also the types of chemicals that are used and whether some kind of moisturizer is a diff differently needed in order to reduce the effect of uh, excessive particle generation. It also stands that um, whichever way that works, the typical effect is between six and seven hours. So after six or seven hours, then we do tend to see a, a rise in particle generation after um, a skin has been subject to, to a moisturizer. So there's a number of things that need to be reviewed in relation to entering clean rooms. So these include uh, selecting the appropriate types of clean room undergarments used and an examination as to whether these provide an effective barrier, especially for the areas of the body that are naturally more moist. 
there's the importance of the outer gown covering all parts of the body, including the forehead, as we saw from those uh, human microbiome figures, that the uh, forehead is particularly rife with staphylococcus, micrococcus, and perennial bacteria. We need to ensure that the undergarments are as, have the same level of quality checks and are certified to the same level as overgarments. We need to ensure that the level of training required for operators in relation to gowning and the way that gowning is conducted is mapped out. I'll say more about that later on. There needs to be limits on how long a clean room suit should be worn for. And this is particularly important in relation to material integrity as against operator perspiration. So a suit cannot be worn indefinitely. We also need to have good control over the environment in which gowns are donned. And often we want to have higher air exchange rates in changing rooms in order to address the level of particles that will be shed, particularly where people are moving from one level of clothing to another. And then there's discussions about ready-to-use gowns against gowns that are recycled. And where gowns are recycled, and where this involves washing and irradiation, then at some point the material fibres will weaken, thereby reducing the bacterial filter efficiency of the gown. So here the users of gowns should know what types of testing are conducted on recycled gowns and what procedures are in place for rejecting gowns ahead of when a loss of integrity might be detected. So with garments, the picture on the slide is a microscopic image of fibres, and this is from a polyester coverall at a 180 magnification. So all gowns will have a filtration efficiency rating, and it's very important that you understand the filtration efficiency rating of the gowns you are purchasing, and to make sure that that rating is appropriate. And there's always going to be a balance between getting the maximal filtration efficiency rating and the level of comfort that the gown delivers. So the better the filtration efficiency, then the poorer the comfort experienced by the user. And this is due to the rise in heat. So people often wearing certain gowns might become a little bit hot and bothered. So this is dependent upon the way by which the textile fabric is woven. The tighter the weave, the poorer the breathing capacity of the material, and the less comfortable it is to use. On the other hand, the looser the weave, the better the breathing capacity, and the more comfortable it is. But towards another extreme, then that ability of that gown to filter out bacteria and fungi, but still allow sufficient air passage might be too weak. So understanding that, making sure that operators are comfortable, but we do have the best filter efficiency, is a really important choice to make. And those of you who are microbiologists need to understand what the filter efficiency of your gowns are. So with gown types, there is a choice between re-laundered or reusable gowns. And um, I have no personal preference as, as to which is the most efficient. And there are factors that are important to weigh up, and different suppliers of other types of gown can provide supporting information for this. But there will be cost issues. There will be convenience issues in terms of uh, whether gowns are come in as single-use disposable items against sorting gowns, multiple wash cycles, drying, cooling down and inspection, as against relative cost. Then there is operator comfort, the degree of thickness, weight, flexibility, drape, strength and durability, the ease of supply and delivery. The sterilization method is important. For example, whether a gown, if it's a reusable gown, for example, whether it's irradiated or subject to steam sterilization, 
that may well affect the longer term stability of the gown and how many times that gown could be subject to um, what are fairly aggressive um, processes. And then, as I mentioned before, the bacterial filter efficiency rating. And again, with uh, relieved gowns, whether this declines over time or remains the same after, say, 50 cycles of washing and sterilization again. Now, gowning requ uh, requirements will differ for different areas. So there's going to be differences of going through unclassified areas and then for grade D and grade C areas. Now, with unclassified areas, that still requires a level of gown change. So the revised EUGMP Annex 1 clearly states that to enter a grade C clean room, you cannot do so wearing any form of outdoor clothing. So an initial change in an unclassified area or a grade D area is required in order to meet regulatory compliance expectations for entering a grade C area. But grade C and D areas will have to make decisions over suit types, head covers, masks and gloves. With grade B areas, it'll, there'll be a requirement for an undersuit and also head covers. The specifications for oversuits, the types of boots, masks, uh, gloves, and again, um, whereas in the past uh, safety glasses may have been worn, the revised um, Annex 1 now requires complete coverage with no exposed skin, which um, directs us towards the requirement to wear goggles. Now, with aseptic operations, we need to apply the strictest requirements. So only personnel who are qualified and appropriately gowned should ever be permitted access to an aseptic processing area. The gowns used must provide a barrier between the body and any exposed sterilized materials. And to prevent or at least minimize down to the lowest possible level, any contamination from particles generated by and microorganisms shed from the human body. The gowns must be sterile. The gowns must be non-shedding. The gowns must cover all skin and hair with the addition of face mask hoods, beard, moustache covers if necessary, protective goggles and elastic gloves. There needs to be written procedures that detail how to get changed in the most effective aseptic manner. It's also useful to have an adequate barrier that can be reinforced by overlapping of gown components, such as gloves and overlapping sleeves. And if any gown becomes torn or is any way spotted to be defective, then the operator must exit the aseptic area immediately and the gown changed by the operator going through the changing gowning process again. Now, with re-laundered gowns, things such as repairs and laundering are important. And here we need to consider how are suits cleaned and laundered. So here, anybody purchasing, re uh, dealing with gowns that are re-laundered, it's very important for both production staff and for microbiologists to have audited the uh, gown provider. So we need to know how suits are cleaned and laundered. We need to know what the maximum time that a suit can be laundered for is. And again, you in your facilities should know this and know how that is tracked and is traced. And a good way to do this is through the use of barcodes or microchips. We also need to understand how cleanliness is assessed and uh, whether the manufacturer is undertaking the appropriate particle drum test to assess this. And then if the gown is subject to steam sterilization or irradiation, then the steam cycle, cycle must be understood. And with the irradiation, then we need to know that the dose is controlled and the time is controlled. And also the number of times that garments can be subjected to sterilization and again how this is controlled because 
all sterilization technologies are highly aggressive to any kind of fibrous materials and there will be a point in time when that sterilization process will cause a sufficient level of damage. There are also some important suit management issues to consider. So for example, with um, repairs, uh, we need to know what makes for a good repair policy. Do you have a repair policy in your facility? Um, some facilities may say no repairs at all, the gown must be destroyed. Others might have something around the size of the hole. So they might say a hole no larger than the diameter of a five pence piece can be repaired. Anything larger leads to gown rejection, for example. And it, some places might have uh, a policy on the number of repairs. So like one tear could be repaired, but two tears cannot be repaired. Or if a suit has had one repair a couple of cycles ago, it cannot be repaired again. And there may be factors relating to the location of the tear. So if it's close to a seam or put on a seam, then the answer might be no, it cannot be repaired. Or there may be differences on the grade of, green, of clean room suit. So for example, you may have that grade D gowns can be repaired, but those worn in grade B areas cannot be repaired. However it goes, there's no right or wrong answer, but it's really important that you understand your gown repair policy. And often this is something which microbiologists and production staff are not aware of. It might be something buried in a purchasing department. But you need to take ownership of these types of things. Time is also an important factor. So you need to have a policy and ideally some qualifying data for how long can a suit be worn for. And is there a difference for suits that might be worn over an undersuit or in a grade B over clothes? compared to where suits are worn over um, an undersuit, for example. There may be variations with clean room grade. And there might be differences um, where temperature humidity are either controlled or are not controlled. But here, certainly for aseptic processing areas, you definitely need to have a maximum gown time. And you can draw inferences from that by looking at exit suit plate data, for example. So if you have uh, four hours, for example, then you can use suit plate data to, to support that decision. Another factor to consider across all types of gowns is the quality of the packaging. So can the packaging survive the sterilization process? Is it subject to not being affected by wear and tear? And also, what happens when the packet is opened? How is the suit been folded? Does it be open and it falls out and it, and it lands on the, the legs or the arms land on the floor? Or can they be opened in such a way that the operator can keep control of it and the operator then can avoid arms and legs landing on the floor? And again, you shouldn't be accepting whatever the garment supplier gives you. You should be saying to the garment supplier how you want that suit wrapped. And of course, it's a service that you pay for, but you are paying a lot of money for the gowns and they should be wrapped to suit whatever you want for your facility. Now, even if gowns are of good quality, they can become contaminated if they are not put on properly or they're not looked after correctly. So, to link back to what I said earlier, before you go near a changing room, you need to make sure that all makeup, such as lipstick, blusher, eyeshadow, mascara, eyeliner, powder, foundation, or any other cosmetic applied to the face or neck area has been removed. You need to make sure that the gowning policy is in tune with other things that are likely to affect um, either particle generation or affect gown integrity. So, for example, um, Nail extension should be removed. Hair extension should be removed. Um, if somebody's had a tattoo recently, you need to make sure that that tattoo is not uh, whipping in any form. So there's various factors to, to kind of consider as part of this process. 
we should make sure that the changing area itself is appropriately designed. Now, at the beginning, I spoke about clean room basics and clean room design, and I mentioned about air change rates. Now, in a changing room, you're going to want to have far faster change, uh, air change rates than you would have in a conventional clean room. So we're talking really ideally about 60 or 80 air changes per hour. So you've got that good sweeping motion uh, to try and drive away any particles that are produced. You also want to control the number of operators present in the clean room. So every clean room must have a maximum number of people who are admitted in there, and that must relate back in some shape or form to the environmental monitoring data. Otherwise, now you could think that your clean room can cope with three people and your plates are okay, and then one day there's 10 people in there. You've got no idea what impact that excessive number of people is having on the confined environment. And you also need to make sure that um, there are um, defined exit and entry routes. And for many years, it's been customary for aseptic processing clean rooms to have separate ways in and ways out. But again, you may well have noticed that from the revised EUGMP Annex 1, it now talks about grade C and grade D changing rooms having separate entry and exit routes as well. So in terms of what might be a good downing practice, then there are some ideas on the slide there that might be worth considering and for you to check in your um, SOPs against and seeing whether all of these items are covered. So before entering the gowning room, then it's a good idea that um, any contamination that might be introduced on the footwear is reduced. So here you can use um, sticky or tacky mats or things like polymeric flooring. And again, research shows that three steps are required on each foot in order to reduce the a level of contamination sufficiently before entering the changing room. So there's no point having a very tiny mat that people only take one step on. This is not sufficient. Some facilities do use shoe brush cleaners as well. Uh, there's the importance of either changing shoes or donning uh, shoe covers. It's very important to have washed hands or to use an alcohol solution. Um, some people use clean room glove lines and apply alcohol solutions to the outside of the liners. It's important to put on clean room gloves in an aseptic fashion. It's important then to apply um, appropriate hand sanitizer to those gloves. If people have um, facial hair, this must be fully covered. Um, there should always be a clean room hat or clean room hood put on face masks, applying overalls so they do not um, touch the floor. If they do, or if they do have to momentarily touch the floor, then it's always on the clean side of the gown and bench. Hoods must always be tucked inside of overalls. Um, then it's important to put on boots and final layer of gloves and to ensure that everything is overlapping. Um, so there's just some areas on there that might be worth double checking. It's also important to have mirrors in every clean room so the operator can look at that and see that they look okay before they um, go in there. It's also important that when someone steps over, uh, a step over, every single time that happens that that step over is disinfected so that the next person who's stepping over is not picking up any contamination. So they're just in the way of good practice techniques that can be reviewed and embedded into uh, your gowning procedures. You also need to develop um, best practices for gown training. So you need to assess whether your operators are, are trained in good gowning. And it's a very useful thing to do. And uh, I remember um, an MHRA inspector saying this, that when a new starter joins, what they should spend most of their time doing is just practicing gowning over and over again. And really nobody should be doing a gowning test until they've done at least 10 practice gowns. It's also useful for every new starter to be video recorded, uh, particularly during these initial training gowning sessions, and for those video recordings to be played back to each trainee so they can see how they're doing and look out for common pitfalls and thoughts and so on. 
it's also useful to have um, when someone's going through their down qualification, which is required for entry into grade B areas, and it's good practice to have something in place for other grades of clean room as well, is for this to be independently assessed through observational checklists, and particularly if we're going into aseptic areas for environmental monitoring to be conducted. So there's maybe the exposure of subtle plates, which give an idea of how much uh, may or may not be in shed through the gowning process. Uh, taking finger plates uh, at the end of the process when, when the gloves have been, the final gloves have been done. And then to have exit suit plates taken as well. And this all forms valuable information about the ability of the person to gown correctly as well. Now with um, face masks, Face masks can be used to uh, protect the product as well as being useful for personal protection. And when used for personal protection, masks normally have um, much uh, different efficiencies compared to when it's been used for product protection. And it's very important that face masks are not made from material that will dispense fibers into the environment. They need to provide adequate filtration, so exactly like a clean room suit, all face masks will come with a bacterial filter efficiency rating, and you need to make sure that rating is suitable for the application. So, for example, for an aseptic processing area, then you want to make sure that the masks have at least 97.5% bacterial efficiency rating. Masks also have to be easy to use. So it's not going to go masks that are difficult for someone to do up, because they'll be all fingers and thumbs, and that will lead to contamination events. For the aseptic protein areas, masks must be sterile and must be shown to be able to take the sterilization process. And you need to make sure that your environmental monitoring lab masks um, can detect the organisms you're concerned about. So uh, one of the biggest organisms of concern are the streptococci. And um, there are some varieties of Tryptone soya agar TSA out there, which cannot actually adequately detect streptococci. So you may have a problem with poor mask control without knowing it because you're not actually able to detect the very organism that you're concerned about. Now, with clean room gloves, gloves are worn for one of two reasons. They're there to protect the wearer from exposure to dangerous or irritative substances and they're there to protect clean rooms and products from the contaminants that could be introduced through operators, equipment, or airborne particles. And pharmaceutical manufacturers will require sterile gloves, with, which will come in clean room designated packaging. And these should be resistant to the chemicals used, the product, cleaning, and disinfection solutions, for example. They should have good physical strength, making all actions of clean room activity possible without being without tearing. Standard surgical glove packaging generally uses polycellulose spun woven fabric, which generates a high count of particles when opened and handled. So you need to make sure that you're purchasing proper clean room gloves, not just standard hospital gloves, for example. Clean room glove packaging generally features polyethylene easy opening packaging, which is washed with deionized water, assembled in a, a clean room with low particle activity, and then packaged for delivery inside um, an ISO class 5 clean room, which means that when that packaging is opened, it itself is not generating high levels of particles. So that's another important consideration when you're specifying clean room gloves. Each company should have a rationale or specification in place for glove selection. And they should outline the key criteria for glove selection. So you need to consider in such a document, does the type of glove affect my hand sanitization practices? Is a different contact time required for the gloves in comparison with bare hands? So this is where you may have written down that you need to sanitize for 30 seconds. But is 30 seconds still appropriate? Does that need to be increased to 60 seconds, for example? We just need to consider whether some hand rubs or glove sprays are more suitable than others, and that might be a feature on the type of material that the gloves formed from, particularly if it's got um, kind of um, maybe ridges on it to help with grip. These kind of gloves are going to be 
much harder to disinfect and sanitize properly. We also need to consider whether there's any risk of leachables from the glove material, which might then again cause you processing problems. So we looked at some things for masks, gloves, and seats, and this is kind of building up to what might go into your garment policy. In terms of what else you might need to consider, you know, suit specification as well. Um, need to consider, make sure you've got the most appropriate sizes as well. What we don't want to have is trying to squeeze uh, large cleaning operators into tiny suits, so you don't want to have smaller cleaning operators in big suits that start blowing out and um, producing particles. You may want to consider the anti-static properties of the suit, because this will then be uh, less likely to attract particles. Chemical resistance may be a factor depending on what activities people are engaged in. Um, and again, these things I mentioned before about laundering requirements, sterilization requirements, and particle generation. And all this just start to embed in your good uh, downing specification. But there are still risks. And this happens primarily because human personnel are shedding such high numbers of skin cells, as I mentioned earlier. Most uniform are skin flakes. And clean men garments cannot contain all forms of human detritus. Um, and you can then start to overlay what you might find in clean men's from environmental monitoring with what might have originated from the people and then linked to what might be connected with the human microbiome. And uh, some of these I've gathered from a, a study that I undertook, um, which was a 10-year review of uh, clean room microorganisms. Um, and uh, this is a publication which um, we can provide you all with a free copy if you're interested. Um, so if you would like a copy of this one, then please just email info at farmig.org.uk and we will send you a copy of that. And now we mentioned a little bit about uh, people monitoring. And it is important to um, undertake gown you know, qualifications, as we mentioned. It's also very important for aseptic areas to undertake exit suit plates. So these are agar plates pressed onto the suit as people leave the facility. And there's choices then to be made about locations. But it's important that it's done at every exit. And it needs to be at exit because the act of taking the suit contact plate affects the integrity of the gown. So it would be bad practice to take suit contact plates and then still have people wearing the gowns and working in the area. And then the periodic taking of thinner plates as well is an important assessment of good glove management and control. Um, and with gown qualifications, um, again, there are some different approaches that can be taken. Um, so visual observation, downing whilst environment monitoring is taking place. Some facilities have people um, then having to uh, walk around an active air sampler, which gives an indication of the likely levels of um, shedding. And then having maybe additional, maybe someone's taking more downing plates than would be taken for standard exit suit monitoring in order to give a overview of the rigorousness of, of the gowning process. Um, in terms of how often such activities should be performed, well, there isn't actually anything in the UGMP. However, the FDA, in its um, sterile products manufacturing guidance, says that an annual requalification is normally sufficient. Um, although it then has a caveat that you may want to do this more frequently. In my experience, the frequency ranges anything between three months and one year, but overall the most common frequency tends to be every six months. And perhaps more often are, if operators are returning after a prolonged um, absence. 
So in terms of the taking of, of the plates, um, you do have choices to make about the number of locations, the ATC plates, uh, how you're going to select locations, how long the contact plate will remain in contact with the gown for, and whether there is any control over pressure that can be made. And these are key decisions that you need to make, and there's no necessarily right or wrong answers, but needs to be embedded into a rationale of some form. It's also important when we're talking about doing this activity as people exit, it's also important that the gown is removed only in a changing room as well, not in an exit corridor, um, because there will be agile residues that can then be deposited, and these can cause um, contamination problems. In terms of what the regulations are saying, um, again, there's not really any real guidance in the EGMP, even in the revised MX1. But the FDA guidance is a little bit more prescriptive. So it's talking about several locations on the whole garment system. So gloved fingers, face mask, forearm, and chest. And the FDA also say that there needs to be a rationale in place saying why those locations are being sampled and why other locations have not been selected to be sampled. So it's very important to have a defined rationale there. Um, following initial assessment of gowning, periodic requalification as well it is also mentioned in the FDA thing which we uh, discussed in the previous slide. So looking at um, locations, um, it's uh, typical to do somewhere around the top of the head. It's also typical to do the face mask. It's typical to do both arms because both arms will be involved in some way of breaking the um, aseptic barrier. The middle of the body is good, as are, as are the legs. But you know, every facility will have a different approach on how many they take and uh, why they take them. And results can also um, vary. From my experience, it's top of the head that tends to record the highest counts. But also the data generated can inform about key activities. So if you're getting something up from a leg periodically, you suddenly might find that there's some awkwardness that requires the cleaning operator to kneel on the floor. And again, you probably want to design something that prevents that from happening. Recovery from arms might be indicating that there's a risk with, with interventions. And also results can help with linking contamination events together. So if you get the same organism on the arms, finger dabs, and then perhaps from a surface within the critical location, this can give you some really solid information about the risks and vulnerabilities involved with a particular aseptic um, intervention. With um, finger plates, this is where the fingers and thumb are pressed onto the agar plate. And here you want to have a defined technique to avoid you know, contamination the activity. It, this should also be more effective if you have a second operator holding the plate and removing the lid and keeping that plate steady. And you need a degree of consistency over, over pressure and time as well. And it's important that these finger dabs are taken after performing critical activities. Um, you can use a nine centimeter plate or a smaller 25 millimeter contact plate but the smaller plate does make it more awkward to get good coverage of fingers and so on. And once these plates have been taken, it's really important that hands are disinfected immediately uh, to remove agar residues. It's equally important that hands are not disinfected immediately prior to the activity because this actually takes away all the value of doing the plate and indicating where there might be a contamination source. Um, so it's important that um, this is occasionally um, reviewed. The agar as well should contain a disinfectant neutralizer because there may be residues of the hand disinfectant remaining on the gloves. A related area is with the sampling of um, gauntlets as well. Uh, so these are the type of things that are used in isolators and wraps and these need to be fully extended um, during bark and decontamination cycles and sampled post-activity. And these can be quite awkward to sample, so honing in, developing the technique is something equally that is important. 
We also need to set um, appropriate alert and action levels for gowns and gloves as well. And again, the regulations don't provide any clear guidance about this. Um, but um, it's important to have both because the alert level is indicating when we may have potential drift and the action level indicates when we've actually gone outside the normal operational range. And here are some examples of some levels that could be applied. So the thing about in grade A is going to be a limit of one due to the risk that it's posed into the process. Uh, for grade B, then uh, typically would have five. And the gown plate is, tends to be, the gown is assessed as a grade B thing because you can't have people working long term in, in, in grade A. And that would have similar levels to the um, finger plate. However, there are some differences in practice. Some organizations have five per location and some have um, that the, the total summation of all the contact plates cannot exceed five. The most important aspect with environmental monitoring is with trending of data. Um, and here the use of graphs and tables is very helpful. Control charts can help to visualize the process. And it's handy to have as much information as possible so we can draw meaningful inferences from the data such as sample location, sampling times, uh, sampling dates, if there's been any changes to design of activities, whether there's new equipment, whether we can measure shifts in personal or other changes, whether there's a factor of seasonality, if the room temperature went too high, and so on. Thank you for watching, and please subscribe to my YouTube channel for further video updates. Thank you.